Welcome to Road Safety Audits, brought to you by the South Carolina LTAP. My name is Todd, Todd Morrison, and I'll be your instructor for the workshop. And today we're going to be talking about roadway safety audits. This is a tremendous tool for improving safety on your roadway network. We're going to cover why do we need road safety audits? What is involved in a road safety audit? How do you do that? And then we're going to give you an example of how to do a road safety audit. And I really want to start with why do we need those? This particular map comes from NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Association. And on this map, you're seeing South Carolina. Each one of those red dots is a fatal crash that occurred in 2018, just 2018, and there might have been multiple fatalities. So each one of those circles, each one of those red circles represents a fatal crash that had one, two, maybe three or more individuals that were killed on our roadways. In 2018, around the United States, we had over 36,000 roadway fatalities. That many people perished on our roadways. In South Carolina alone, there were over a thousand. And this impacts all parts of the state. I wanted to zoom in a little bit so you could get an idea of how it impacts different areas. This is 2018 numbers still. And again, each one of these red circles is a fatal crash. At least one person lost their life there. I zoomed in on the Greenville Spartanburg area so you can see uh, just how much of a problem it is. And to me, that's the why. The why is that we have the opportunity to bring those numbers down. And I'm going to go on and say that as the owners and the managers of roadway systems, whether you're with the city, the county, or the state, we have the duty to do whatever we can to make these roads safer. Another thing that's near and dear to my heart is having been to a lot of fatal crash locations, read a ton of crash reports or collision reports as we would call them now. A lot of these users are vulnerable users. I really don't want anybody to perish on the roadways, but when it's a grandmother or it's a small child, it's even more egregious. And so if there's something that we can do to bring those numbers down, I think that we would be very remiss in our duties if we didn't. Another reason that we need roadway safety audits is it helps bring safety to the forefront. And we can do a roadway safety audit for existing roads, and that may be how you've thought about them traditionally. We can also do them though for design projects, ones that are still in the, the design phase. And there's a lot of things that are competing for limited dollars. And oftentimes safety really gets pushed to the to the back of the, the line. A road safety audit though, it makes sure that safety is able to compete with all of these other portions of the project. It allows them to, again, compete for those limited dollars and ensures that safety does not fall through the cracks on our projects. Also, a roadway safety audit allows us to control a portion of these crashes. And what I mean by that is that crashes have many causes. And this Venn diagram shows those causes. As you're looking at that, you're going to see that human factors, things that the drivers do, well, they're present in 95% of our crashes. So if you've thought, hey, the driver is one of the biggest problems. Driver distraction is one of the biggest issues. Well, you're correct. But if you've also thought there's not much I can do about it, then in that case, you're wrong. Because when you look at this Venn diagram, you'll find out that road environment factors are there in 28% of the crashes. And as an owner of the roadway, that's what you can have a direct impact on. Let me give you an example of how that might play out. One of the first 
fatal crashes that I went to look at as a young maintenance engineer for the, the DOT, this lady had been driving down the road and for whatever reason, uh, she left the right-hand shoulder of the roadway. When she left the right-hand shoulder of the roadway, it was a fairly narrow road of ours in a rural area. She dropped off the right-hand shoulder, overcorrected, tried to come back up on the roadway too fast, came back across the road in a skid, and the driver's door impacted a large tree on the edge of the, or close to the edge of the roadway. And she died there on impact. And as we went out there to look at that, the human factor, of course, was whatever made her leave the roadway. Uh, whether it was driver distraction, uh, we're not sure what made her leave the roadway. But once she left the roadway, the severity of that crash, a large part of that lay in our hands as a DOT. When I had that drop off there, that was a problem. That was something that led her uh, or had the possibility of overcorrecting. Anytime we have a shoulder to the blacktop to the earth shoulder drop off of three inches or more, it's definitely a problem for the motorist. When she tried to overcorrect, which is a natural reaction, she came across the road in a skid. Then when she hit that large tree, that fixed object hazard that I had within the clear zone, an area next to the roadway that we try to keep free and clear of anything that might harm or kill the motorist, that greatly contributed to what we would say the severity of the crash. You know, if that tree hadn't have been there, it might have still been an injury crash or it might have been a property damage only, but I don't think we'd been looking at a fatality. And any tree that is over four inches in diameter is definitely has a potential uh, to be a killer. And so those are the, the road environment factors and how they play into the human factors. This picture illustrates that there are vehicle factors as well. You know, our vehicles break down, but, or they have malfunctions, but that's getting better. You know, as we look at the history of this, our vehicles are getting much, much better now than they were 40 years ago. They're much safer now than they were 40 years ago. What's really dropped though, are humans. Humans really are much more distracted now than they used to be. Uh, but again, as county road departments, as city street departments, as DOTs, the part that we have the biggest control over is the roadway. And that's what a road safety audit primarily focuses on. I wanna build the case for why we need the road safety audit. I showed you the numbers, uh, the number of individuals that die on our roadways, over 35,000 in the US, over 1,000 per year in South Carolina alone. So when, another reason we need this is that when we look at those collision reports, we can't often identify the roadway safety issues. A road safety audit is done with a field review. You're gonna go out there into the field, you're gonna look, you're gonna to try to figure out what's going on. And that allows us to anticipate and accommodate those common driver errors. And I guess what I mean by that is we try to approach this animal from crash reduction from four different areas, education, enforcement, EMS, and engineering. Enforcement is used, we pass laws against texting, uh, talking when you're driving, we pass seatbelt laws, we make those primary secondary offenses. But oftentimes as uh, it's hard to influence that driver behavior and as county road owners, city street owners, we really don't have any play in that at all. That falls to the enforcement side. But on the engineering side, that's another one of the four E's, enforcement, engineering, we do have a, a role to play there. And we can figure out what we think people are gonna be doing. We can look at crash data for our state, uh, for South Carolina, for our city or our county, and we can figure out what the most prevalent human factors are and design for those. The other two were education and EMS. We try to educate the public. We have arrive alive campaigns, ticket or click it campaigns. And then the fourth one was EMS. 
we find that the faster that we can get you medical attention, the greater the chance is that you're going to make it. You know, so if we can reduce that response time down for EMS to get to you and get you to a skilled medical care facility, then your chances of living go way up. Another reason we need road safety audits is it demonstrates a proactive approach. And what I mean by that is if you're just following the crash data, the collision data, then that means people have already died. Injuries have already occurred. A road safety audit allows you to get in front of that and maybe prevent those from happening. And that's the best stance to take. They're proven. Uh, for years, we've been doing road safety audits and the success uh, rate is demonstrated. It's measurable. It's accepted. So that's why we need the road safety audits. Now let's look at what is a road safety audit. A road safety audit is a formal examination of the roadway from a safety standpoint. And when I say formal, that means that we're going to get a team together. We're actually going to write a report. That report is going to be responded to by the road owner. So it is formal. And it's also done by independent multidisciplinary team. So it's best done with individuals that are not in direct control of that roadway. That way they can give you a, a true independent look at it. Multidisciplinary, we'll talk about a little bit later on, but you need a full range of individuals on that team to represent the different disciplines. A road safety audit also looks at all the road users. So we don't just think about the cars. We also think about the trucks, especially if there's a large percentage of commercial trucks. We think about the pedestrians. And you can do a pedestrian walkability audit, but we consider that. How are they crossing the road? Uh, do we have the handicap ramps? Are those crosswalks marked? Is the signage appropriate? We can also think about our bicyclist, our motorcyclist, whatever the makeup of the uh, individuals using our transportation facility is, that's what we can do. That's what we look at and that's what we, we consider. Also on the road safety audit, we're gonna make suggestions for how to mitigate these safety issues. In other words, suggestions for improvements that the county or the city or the DOT could do. Now, when do we do a road safety audit? It can really be done at any point in the lifetime of the project. It can be done in the design phase. Uh, and we might do that, especially if it's a complex design or it's a safety project. But it can be done then, design. It can be done while the job is being constructed. Or it can be done uh, on the existing roadway one that you have that's open to traffic that you're maintaining. So that's why we need the road safety audit. A little bit about what it is. The next thing I want to go over with you is what steps are involved. And I have here eight steps that you can see. Uh, as you're looking at those, you're going to notice light blue over one and two and seven and eight. Those are for the project owner, the city street department or the county road department, if you will. The road safety audit team is in the darker blue. That's steps three, four, five, and six. I'd like to walk through each one of these steps, give you a little bit about it, a little bit of information about each one. The first one is identify the project. And here you have to decide which road am I going to do a road safety audit on? And is it going to be a design project or is this going to be a road that's already existing in service? And at this point, I'd like for you to get a piece of paper and a pencil and write down a road that comes to your mind. When I said that, you probably had a road pop into your head. Oh, yeah, here's one we need to do it on. And if that happened to you, write it down. I want you to walk through this with me. Go ahead and get a start on your road safety audit. So you got your road written down? 
well, then you've identified your project. And as you've identified that project, I want you to think about that. Is it in service, existing road, or is this a design stage project? Either one of those is okay. Now, if you selected an in-service road safety audit, and most of the ones I've done have been in-service, when you wrote that down, you might've written it down for several reasons. It could have been a high crash site. So you might know either through crash data or anecdotally, which is what we refer to as stories or just word of mouth, you might know of roads that have a lot of crashes. And that could be why you, you selected it. It could also be one where maybe the individuals that died, it made the headlines, or it's a road that is of significance to your agency. It could also be an area where maybe we just put up a traffic control signal, and we know that we're beginning to have crashes there. So think about that. Which one did you write down? Was it high crash, high profile? Was it changed traffic characteristics? Or was it a design project that you were working on? Well, step two is to pick your road safety audit team. And these are the individuals that are going to be on the team. Uh, they're going to go through the next several steps. And when you select that team, one, it's encouraged for it to be independent. So that could be uh, a consultant coming in. If you don't have the funds to spend on that, then I encourage you to get with a local, another local agency or to get with LTAP or to get with the DOT and have them help you out with that. Oftentimes, the DOT will provide a, a traffic engineer to be available on that road safety audit team for your local city street or your local county road. And that comes down to the bottom part where it says multidisciplinary. It's really best to have a traffic engineer on that team, someone who's experienced with how we mitigate some of these safety problems. You could also have the HSIP coordinator from your local highway district. Uh, state DOT come. HSIP is the Highway Safety Improvement Program. That's likely going to be your traffic engineer as well. And they're going to be well versed in low cost countermeasures. They also might have access to some of the crash data for you. Another way to get individuals on your team is maybe you partner with another local city. Perhaps your city street superintendent is going to help them and be on their road safety audit team when they look at their city streets, and then their city street superintendent will swap out with you, and they'll be a member of your team. Others that I would put on that team, besides somebody from the maintenance department or the city street department and a traffic engineer, I really like to get somebody from law enforcement there or EMS that helps represent one of the other four E's that's out there. Additionally, the law enforcement, it's been my experience, they know more than they write on the collision reports. You know, they have thoughts, they have ideas, they've been able to recognize patterns. And I highly encourage you to get either somebody from the State Highway Patrol or somebody from the local police department or sheriff's office, get them on the team as well. In addition to that, if you wanted to add uh, a concerned citizen or a local group, you could do that to allow them to voice their opinions. Someone from the education spectrum of it as well might be a good person. And that way you touch on those four E's, education, enforcement, EMS, and engineering. Now there is a little bit of caution there. You don't want to get too many people on your team. And I say this from personal experience, having done the road safety audits many times, it's best if you all drive in one vehicle. And then when you go out there to the roadway, you can have a great discussion on what you're seeing for that field visit. You can discuss what those concerns are, uh, how you might suggest mitigating those concerns, those safety concerns. If you get 10, 12 people on your road safety audit team, then quickly you have three, four conversations and not everything gets recorded. So it's best to have a small team that can fit in one vehicle. So I would 
suggest three to five individuals. And what I'd like for you to do is pause for a second and write down anybody that came to mind that might be part of your road safety audit team. You've already identified your project. That was step one. Hopefully you have that road written down. Step two was to pick that team. Write down who you're going to put on that team. Once you decide that, the next thing you're going to do is step three, you're going to have a startup meeting. In this startup meeting, you're going to gather all of the road safety audit team together, and you're going to give them as much information on that roadway as possible. If you can get access to the crash data, supply that. If you can do an analysis of that crash data, to show what the patterns are, definitely, that's great information. If you can have a crash map with the crashes located on it, that's fantastic as well. That's going to allow you to maybe select some hotspots. Uh, we do look at the hotspots with the road safety audit, but we and a hotspot is a collection of crashes, but I also encourage you to take a systemic approach. In other words, look at the crash types especially with cities and counties, the number of crashes we have is often small. So instead of having three years of crash data, you might have five or even up to 10 years worth of crash data. And with those small amount of crashes, those small data sets, we find out that the crash locations themselves are random, but the crash types are not. And so we look for hotspots, but then also we look at the, the analysis of the crash data to try to figure out how can we approach this from a systemic manner? Uh, for example, the road you're looking at, if the majority of your injury, severe injury and fatalities occurred in curves, but maybe the locations were random and scattered down this 20 mile county road, then perhaps you're looking at upgrading the horizontal alignment of the curve signage for every change in the roadway alignment that needs it, you know, placing curves on every curve signs on every curve that needs it. That would be an example of a, a systemic approach. Or here's something the South Carolina DOT has done. They've upgraded a lot of their intersections because they realized that was uh, one of their crash types, intersection crashes that was leading to those high fatalities. So they've tried to address those on a systemic approach. But the crash history, how many vehicles a day uh, photographs are great. You get all the information you can together and you go over it in the room. You do that first. Once you get all of that information reviewed and looked at, you get the comments of the law enforcement, the city street superintendent, the maintenance representative, the traffic engineer, uh, maybe the design engineer, so we can see what those standards are. The next thing you do is you go out in the field and you do a field review for both the design phase and an in-service project. A lot of times we're just thinking about an in-service roadway for that field review, but we also need to do it on the design stage as well. Now for both of these, we're gonna take the design stage, we'll take a set of plans out there and we can see how that project ties in uh, we're going to see how it works with the traffic that we have out there. For an in-service one, we'll be taking aerial, photogra aerial photographs so that we can write information on those. We'll also be taking maps, uh, crash data, all the information that we reviewed back at the office. And while you're out there doing this field review, you're looking for, what are, what are the road users doing? What's the makeup? Is it mainly cars? Are there pedestrians? Are there bicyclists? Is there a lot of commercial traffic? And you're gonna be looking to see, is it heavier at certain times of the day versus others? What does it look like during rush hour? Does the traffic queue or, or line up at times? You're gonna be checking out the existing land uses. Uh, for example, one of the roads we had there was a major soccer complex. This is a state route when I worked for the DOT, a major soccer complex there next to it. And on Monday morning, it looked like it was not a problem. But Saturday, 
my goodness, with all the games that were going on there, this was a major traffic issue uh, because of everything that was generated by the soccer complex on the weekends. You might also be thinking about how does this tie into the existing network? Is there a railroad crossing nearby that might back traffic up into our project? Or are there interstate ramps or other things nearby? You're going to be checking for a lot of the low cost safety improvement items, but really just basic uh, roadway function. You're looking for sight distance issues. The picture on the bottom left definitely has some sight distance issues. And you don't want to think about just the vehicle. You want to be thinking about the pedestrians. And that's especially true if you have pedestrian collisions. You really want to give that a close, a close look. We want to examine how it looks when the traffic flow is heavy, when it's not so heavy. And if we want to look at it in dry and wet conditions, especially wet conditions if we have a high percentage of our crashes that occur during wet weather. Drainage issues, the best time to find those is when it's raining, when it's wet. Additionally, we want to look at it during the day and at night. So oftentimes we would make our first review uh, at the evening rush hour so we could see what it looked like then. And then we'd go grab a bite to eat, wait for it to get good and dark, and then go back out there to see, how does it look now? Can we see those signs? Can we see the pavement markings? Is there anything confusing to us now that was really obvious in the daytime? And that's something else that I want to mention to you is on your team, your road safety audit team, it is a, uh, another good suggestion to get someone on the team that has never seen the road before. Because what happens is if you drive it every single day, and especially if it's your road, you're maintaining it, you get blind to the safety issues. We almost get a nose blind to it. Same thing if there was a really bad odor in the room when you walked in. You notice it right away, but if you're there for a while, yeah, it sort of fades into the background. You forget about it. And that happens with the safety issues on our roadway. We become nose blind to those. So that new person, that fresh person on your team, they can actually see those and they stand out to them better. Now, I mentioned a day and a nighttime inspection. This is what uh, this section of roadway looks like in the daytime. You know, we've got a stop condition. We have Chevron's there, we have pavement markings. But let me tell you, at night, you really can't see any of that. This is the same location at night. And this is why it's important to look at it day and night, wet weather, dry weather, et cetera. And I wanna share with you, it's okay to get out of your vehicle and walk. As a matter of fact, it's encouraged. Things look different when you're standing there observing the traffic, but also looking at the shoulders, the roadway, than when you're driving down the road at 55, 60 miles an hour. You see a lot more and you can recognize or identify a lot more of the safety problems. And if you have sidewalk, you have pedestrian activity, check that out too. Make sure that that's okay. You know, in this photo, you can see that the sidewalk is clearly blocked by vegetation. So are people not going to walk down the sidewalk? Well, they're still going to go that, this direction, but they're going to walk out into the roadway. And they're likely to get run over when they do. I want to show you a couple other things that you might encounter when you're doing your road safety audits. Love this photo. Somebody thought it was a great idea to stick a power pole right there in the middle of the roadway. Or maybe the power pole was there first and they widened the roadway around it. Either way, Ideally, we would get rid of that thing. It's right there in the middle of the way. Uh, at the edge of the roadway, it's a tremendous safety hazard. And as you're doing the road safety audits, when you recognize something that's a safety issue, you're going to suggest maybe some short-term solutions and long-term solutions. And we base that upon funding. To remove that power pole would be very expensive, but that would be the long-term solution by the road safety audit team remove that power pole. The short-term solution would be to place uh, some type of object marker on it, either a type two or a type three, preferably a type three object marker. 
Here's another common set of issues that you find on road safety audits. We have a shoulder drop off of three inches or more, way more than that. Tremendous safety issue like that earlier example that I showed or talked to you about. In addition to that, we have these trees that are over what diameter? Yeah, if you remember, I said four inches in diameter, right next to the roadway in that clear zone. So if someone does drop off the right-hand side of the road, overcorrect, it's very likely they're going to hit one of these trees and be seriously injured, if not killed. On that earlier photo, I didn't see any damage to the trees, but on this one, we do. Uh, so that means that here we'll be taking a reactive approach, whereas on the others, it would have been a proactive. And again, that's one of the benefits of the road safety audit. All right, that was step four, do the field review. And while you're out there in the field, I do want to mention to you, we select someone to be a photographer and a recorder. The recorder is going to take down notes on what everything anybody says, you know, any kind of suggestions for improvement, any kind of comments that they have. The photographer is going to take photos of everything. Uh, they also might take videos of that. And then we're going to bring back all that data. And we may have written those notes on the aerial photographs. That's a great idea, too. As people are talking about different locations, if you get back into the office and you're trying to remember what they said for 10 miles worth of roadway, sometimes it's hard to pin that location down. But if you have the aerial photographs or a good map, then that's much easier to write it on those locations on the map. So step five is to come back into the office and you do a road safety audit analysis. You're going to take all the information from the field review and you're going to select out of those which ones are the best suggestions, what your findings are. And notice I'm not using the word recommendation. Whenever we do a road safety audit and we, we write this down, it's a, it's a formal review of that roadway, we want to use the word suggestion or findings, those words versus recommendation. Uh, we want to uh, give the agency that we're doing the road safety audit for room to say, well, you know, we don't have the budget or we don't have the funds right now to do this particular uh, finding or suggestion. And it's a little bit harder to do when we call it a recommendation. So you're going to come back in. You're going to pick out the best um, suggestions. You're also going to really pick out all the safety concerns. That's the first step. And you'll prioritize those based on risk. You write down your suggestions. You put all that together. And when I talked about prioritizing those safety concerns based on risk, this is a real simple matrix that gives you an idea of that. We look at how likely is it that that crash is going to occur? Is it rare? Is it frequent? And then we next we look at if it does occur, how severe are the consequences? Is it going to be property damage only? Everybody walks away? Or is it likely a fatality might occur? And we give top priority to those things that are have a high chance or likelihood of occurring and have a really high consequence if they do occur. And I talked earlier about the solutions or the suggestions. They would be short-term, quick things, quick wins, I like to call them, that the agency can do. Maybe they're going to remove vegetation from around the sun. Maybe they're going to add some curved signage. Maybe we're going to try to do targeted enforcement for the speeding on this roadway. And then we also recommend long-term solutions that might take more time to go through uh, perhaps a design phase or to get the funding to do those. And if this was a design project, remember you can look at an in-service project or a design project. Where you're at in that design stage makes a difference on what can be done. Early on, before the final alignments decided, we might even make some alignment changes. But after that, we're really looking at much more simple changes like signage. So we gather all of our data. We gather the safety concerns. We also gather the findings or the uh, solutions. We put all of that into a 
presentation, and we're going to give that to the project owner. This is the last part that belongs to the road safety audit team. That project owner is the city, the county, the DOT, or the design team, if that's what it is. We're going to meet with that team, and we're going to give them our preliminary findings, show them what we did out there in the field, and we're going to seek their input on what we found. Then we'll come back, the road safety audit team will, they'll review and they'll revise their report uh, based upon input from the owner. And then they're gonna draft a formal document, a written document that's gonna be given to the owner. It really just goes over everything that they did. It talks about the road, how it was selected, who the team was, what the site visit showed, uh, how they prioritized the safety concerns, and what their suggestions were for improvement. And now we're back in the eight steps to the owner. Remember one, two, seven, and eight were the owner. Three, four, five, and six were the road safety audit team. It's important that the owner of the roadway prepare a formal response. And by formal, I mean just written down. So let me give you an example of how that might play out. This is a skewed intersection with limited sight distance looking to the left. The road safety audit team identified this as a concern. Short term, they recommended paint signage. Maybe longer term, they said, let's cut that bank down on the left-hand side. And then long range, let's look at realigning this to a 90 degree intersection, uh, which is much safer than a skewed intersection. The owner looked at that and they just wrote a written response and you can see the response there and it says we agree with that, but we can't do it with an existing right away. The right away acquisition is going to be a large percentage of our budget and we'll consider it in the future. And that would be an adequate response, especially on those long term ones for some of the short term uh, items that really don't cost a lot. We move on to step eight. And that's incorporate those findings into the project. If this was a in-service project, an existing roadway, then how you do that, of course, could depend upon how much money you have, your availability of funds. If it's pre-construction, maybe it's changes to the design drawings. Well, what I, what I don't want you to do here is say, we don't have the money to do any of it. I really like a quote by Teddy Roosevelt, and he says, do what you can where you are with what you have. So you implement to the best of your ability as many of these items as you can to make that roadway safer. Maybe you can't get them all this year. Maybe it's a two, three year process, but I want you to be continually moving down that roadway or down the roadway of safety. I want you to continually be making your roadway network safer. So that's a little bit about the road safety audit steps that are involved. So far we covered why do we need it? What is a road safety audit? The steps that were involved. The last thing I wanna talk with you about is a road safety audit example. I wanna share one with you. In this photo, you see a intersection, heavily traveled intersection, Haxton Way, Slater Road in the bottom right you see a large facility. Uh, there's even more to that. And the bottom right is a convenience store, but that parking lot also belongs to a casino. So there's a, this is a large traffic generator. As you're looking at that intersection, you will notice uh, crosswalks for the pedestrians. They're in great shape. The pavement markings are in decent shape. The stripes on the roadway. There's a traffic control signals there, stop bars, turn arrows. Etc. Those look to be in good shape, but this is a high crash location. And you don't have to select an entire roadway. You can also pick an intersection or a collection of intersections in your city. So the road safety audit team that was selected, the first thing they did is they looked at what's good, what's working here. And the pedestrian accommodations were working well, they're well marked, 
Uh, this intersection was lit. The lighting is always a great safety countermeasure. The pavement markings were in good shape. But what were some of the issues? Well, some of the issues is because we had the casino there, you had a lot of unfamiliar drivers in this intersection. They also observed a high number of older drivers and some commercial traffic. But the real issues show up when you analyze the crash data. On the left-hand side, you see a collision diagram. That collision diagram uh, goes over the crashes that have occurred. They had 12 high severity angle crashes going westbound to southbound. And over 10 years, they had 13 serious crashes, 16 property damage only, and three deaths. And let me show you how this is happening. The photo on the left hand side, and actually it's just a picture of a collision diagram that they drew. A lot of times we'll do this in the, for the road safety audit, or just when we're looking at crash data, it's a pictorial representation of what's going on with the crashes. And most of the crashes, when you plot this out, you will see people were coming, they were headed westbound and they were turning left. They were gonna be going to southbound. That's the westbound to southbound. And they were struck by individuals that were headed eastbound. So this left turn movement is the most serious. They also had a little bit of trouble with people turning right. They were headed northbound and then they were gonna to turn to go eastbound. They were also struck by this eastbound traffic. And that's important to note because when we go out in the field, now we can really look at solutions based upon what the crash data is telling us. These are some pictures of what's going on. You would have people coming down the road eastbound and they would strike individuals that were turning left from Slater Road onto Haxton Way. Also on the issues, I don't think I mentioned it, but fog was an issue as well. This shows that right-hand turn movement where individuals coming down Slater Road uh, struck that right-hand turn movement. So let me show you a picture of what this looks like. And this is westbound. As this vehicle is turning left, you can see the view that they have. I also want you to notice how small these signal heads are and the fact that it is a permissive left turn. It means that they've got a green ball and if they think it's clear, they can go. And this mentions sun glare as an issue and it definitely can be on east-west routes, early in the morning or late in the evening the sun can blind people. Now this is looking eastbound. And this is the direction that people were, were going when they struck people that were turning left. You see the van there that's turning left. If I was heading into the picture, then I would have potentially struck this next vehicle that is gonna turn left. Their field review also noted a difference in speeds. On the main road, it was 50 miles an hour on Haxton Way, it was 35. So that's the problem. And as they looked at it, the road safety audit team came up with several solutions or suggestions. The low cost ones included adding a protected left turn phase for that westbound to southbound movement. That means that those individuals coming eastbound, they're gonna have a stoplight or they're gonna have a stop ball there when these individuals are turning left. So no more is it gonna be permissive. They said, let's go out there and make it a protected left turn. And at the same time, you can add a protected northbound right turn arrow. Also, they indicated you could do an eastbound acceleration lane for those people that were turning right to give them time to get up to speed. And in addition to changing the configuration of the signal, uh, from permissive uh, to that left turn arrow. They also suggested upgrading the traffic control signal heads themselves. They suggested upgrading to 12 inch signal heads, the standard, 
making those LED, which are much brighter. And that helps a lot, especially in the fog that they mentioned. And this photo on the left-hand side, you'll notice that they have a backplate around it. That helps it stand out as well. The existing ones there at Haxton and Slater did not have a backplate. And then on the backplate, they've added the retroreflective tape that helps it stand out and enhances the visibility or conspicuity of those as well. Another low-cost countermeasure was they noticed that there was a 45 mile per hour zone uh, just before you got to this intersection. And they recommended lowering the speed from 55 to 45 to help with the severity of the crashes. The long-term recommendation was a roundabout. We could consider changing this intersection into a roundabout. Roundabouts have a great track record. Um, roundabouts have, in some studies, have been shown to reduce fatalities by 90%, injury crashes by 75%. And did you hear me there? 90% reduction in fatalities, 75% reduction in injuries. Tremendous crash reduction. Some of the studies have shown an overall 37% reduction in crashes. Now, roundabouts are great devices. They don't fit every situation, though. So you would have to have someone who's familiar with roundabout design to look at this to make sure it's going to work and be a good fit here. But definitely, it's something that could be considered. So in that road safety audit example, just wanted to show you how that they took the crash data, they went out into the field, they identified the safety issues, and then they came up with some findings or suggestions on how to improve that. And they based it on short-term and long-term recommendations. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this brief look at road safety audits. And today we covered initially, if you remember why we need them, Remember, over 35,000 fatalities in the U.S. in 2018, over 1,000 in South Carolina alone. We went over what is a road safety audit, that formal safety examination by an independent multidisciplinary team. And then we went over the eight-step process, and I showed you an example. I appreciate you attending. Uh, this webinar and checking the video out on road safety audits. If you have some questions or you'd like more information, please contact the South Carolina LTAP and their information, contact information is here on the screen. And I hope that you take action on that road that you wrote down that you wanted to do a road safety audit on and that you go ahead and get those team members together and you consider doing one very soon.